All right, so welcome to uh, another episode of The Graph Show, uh, the first episode of 2021. Uh, today with me, I have Ruben Verborg of uh, the uh, Ghent University. He works, he's a professor of uh, de decentralized information, correct? That's right, yes, we do decentralized data on the web. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, decentralized uh, knowledge graphs, uh, particularly personal knowledge graphs, um, that was kind of the, the theme for the, uh, uh, the episode is what is a personal knowledge graph? Uh, so maybe let's just start by uh, defining that. I think there are different, few different um, definitions you could give for, for that. So you could, uh, there, there's a knowledge graph that's about a person. There's a knowledge graph that's created by a person or managed by a person. Um, there's not many definitions and, and there's, there's not one that I stick to, but in general, I'll say, look, for me, personal uh, knowledge graph is all data that you yourself create combined with all data that others create about you. Okay, sure. And um, maybe at some point we can talk about how that relates to um, the notion of a uh, collaborative knowledge base or you know, how we merge personal knowledge uh, graphs together. Um, Yep. But uh, maybe let, let's dig into that that idea of um, uh, a knowledge graph that that is uh, controlled by a person. I know in our previous conversation we had uh, talked about a distinction between data ownership and data control. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by by control of personal data? Yeah. So I think that people are being misled sometimes, but deliberately. Like we talk about about privacy and and so on, and there are, are all issues, but they're not the wrong things to talk about. Like the loss of privacy we have today is ultimately a consequence of a lot of other things. And for me, it's a consequence of loss of control. Uh, so control means that you decide what, what's happening with your data. And what we see on, on platforms today is, is yeah, we, we do have some notion of privacy because we have lots of, of settings, but we don't have control. We don't decide exactly what happens with our data. So what we propose for taking back control is the concept of a personal uh, knowledge vault, so a data vault, in which you store all the data that we just talked about. So things you would normally put on any kind of platform online or put in any kind of system, that is, if it's about you, you just store it in, in your own personal knowledge graph. Uh, that's a general idea. And um, so how does a person uh, uh, manage that, that data? So I think, uh, you know, previously we, we talked about, you know, there'd be apps that, that manage that data. How do the apps uh, um, uh, keep track of which information is pertinent to, to what application? Um, uh, how, how does that work in a personal knowledge vault? Or, so uh, the, data vault? Yeah, there's a difference between the way you think about data today and the day we'll think about data in the future. So today, most data is inseparably connected with the application that you use to create the data. And you also see that many applications only ever read data that they've written there themselves. So this means today, if you want to use an app or a service, you first have to send your data over there, and then only you can, you can use the, the service. Whereas with, if you get a, a personal data vault, uh, then things are different because then the data is in your system already. So it doesn't make sense to give your first name and email address and profile picture another time and to put it in a different system. No, it's up to that system to come get it from you. So the notion of like how will apps know where their data is and, and so on isn't really relevant anymore because data in the future with personal data vaults will not be specific to certain apps anymore. You will have data about yourself, about your personal life, professional life, and so on. And different apps can use it as you give them permission. So this is what it means to be in control. That's a really compelling idea. And yet I can, I think throughout this, this uh, interview, I'm probably going to be playing devil, devil's advocate a little bit on the behalf of you know, the app developers, but different apps will have different expectations of kind of the shape of that data. Okay, so yes, you may have provided your, your, your contact information to one app, but uh, you know, app number two might have different expectations about the formatting, you know, how you provided your address. Okay, it's an address over here, but app number two has its own notion of what an address is. Uh, so how do apps come together on, say, shared vocabularies, shared constraints, um, so that things work as well in um, the uh, uh, in each app's kind of individual, um, uh, you know, data environment? It, it, how do you get things to work as seamlessly uh, in that decentralized world as they would in a world where the app controls the data itself? 
So essentially, there's two kinds of assumptions that you could make. Uh, one group of assumption is, well, there's going to be one day world in which everybody agrees on what data model to use. Um, that's the, the easy way out. Um, the other assumption is there's never going to be such a world. And I see that many systems are preparing for the first case where like, hey, you know what, let's agree on what a person looks like, what a house looks like, what a car looks like. But the approach that, that we take is more like, no, there's never going to be such a world. So we need to be prepared to continuously translate. Like there will never be a final data model. We will have to translate at, at every, every single step. So this means, for instance, that we'll need a notion of universal semantics, like a property will have to have a, a global meaning. That doesn't mean that every application is using the, the same property. It just means that when you encode a piece of data and knowledge graph, you encode it inseparably from uh, the semantics that this piece of the data has. Sure. Um, do you think kind of at a basic level um, that, so you, you say that there'll need to be a common notion of what a property is. Um, you know, uh, RDF is kind of the underlying data model that's that's used uh, in solid, right? Is RDF itself enough or do we need something else on top of RDF? Do we need RDFS? Do we need OWL? Do we need Shackle or Shex um, to be that, that common medium? So when it comes to RDF, um, there's a lot of, of stories you hear about it and, and also about its complexity and so on. But I think there's um, a beautiful quote by um, Dan Brickley and Libby Miller that's about, look, it's not um, RDF that's complex. It's the kind of problems that we're tackling that are just very, very complex. What you've seen is, is the past decade, we have specialized in doing big data systems and we know how to do that very well. And in fact, there's no, no limits, technically speaking, to, to big data because you can always put more data in the same place. There's a couple of assumptions. One, that you can put data in the same place and second, that you can all put it into the same data model. However, what we've seen is that there are uh, limitations uh, to, to how much data you can bring in one place. They're not technical, but they're, they're legal, ethical, social, economical, and, and so on. So yes, 10 years ago, um, the problems that we were tackling weren't RDF kind of problems. Um, so this is why it wasn't really relevant. But now, if data indeed is inherently in different places, well, you need a notion of universal semantics and languages such as, R as RDF do that. Now, RDF itself is just a uh, Meta model for data, really. So, so it's it, it's very basic. So you will indeed need a couple of extra constructs. You've named them like RDFs and all will still be important. Although we shouldn't emphasize the theory too much there. I think uh, being pragmatic is is very important. And new kinds of technologies that, that we'll need is, uh, for instance, everything has to do with writing because a lot of linked data has been about open data in the past, where it's mostly reading. But here we will have to tell different applications, this is how you need to write your data. Yeah, so that will also be important. And of course, uh, query technology is also going to play a major role in, a, in a getting data to the right place at the right, in the right time. Sure. Uh, so as far as control of data, um, that's, that's a really interesting set of problems. Um, so some, some data is co-owned or co-controlled, right? So if I have a personal knowledge graph, inevitably it's going to overlap with the personal knowledge graphs of other people um, or you know, other entities. Um, how do you manage uh, data that is not solely uh, owned by, or you know, to avoid that notion of ownership, uh, yeah. controlled by a single individual? How do you share data yeah. in the sense of uh, I realized that I didn't give you a decent answer earlier about um, ownership. So I'm not a lawyer, but I have been told by several of them that, um, legally speaking, ownership is just a meaningless concept when it comes to data, in the sense that data is a number, right? So who owns the, a certain number? You, you can talk about that. You can talk about who controls it. Like a, a, a number like, like 96 doesn't mean a lot unless you know it's maybe my weight or height or whatever unit and so then it starts getting meaning right so control about that, that number is, is is very important it's like you, you can own a physical goods like a, a house or a, a mug or like any physical object basically but data i mean there's no ownership so control is important control means that i get to say what happens to it now a lot of data is not just just tied to one entity but to multiple entities for instance indeed if, if we take pictures of, of the two of us together. I mean, there, there's something to be said for it. Like, hey, this is a bit of the both of us. So when I started out saying everybody gets their own personal data vault, that's a very initial simplifying assumption. I think in the future, it will be more complex. There will be many data vaults. Uh, there, there will be data vaults for, for families and even for, for, for non-person entities like cars, buildings, rooms, offices can all have data vaults. And if there's indeed uh, multiple 
rights holders for a certain piece of data. Well, there can be multiple controllers there. There's no problem, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. What would be the use case for, say, a car or a room controlling uh, a data vault? So I can see there being information yeah. about a car, about a room, uh, but why would you assign um, data to be owned by uh, a non-person entity? Well, again, it, it's, it's being associated with, right? So mm -hmm. in, in this case, I have very real use cases. So um, here in Belgium, for instance, there, there's quite a couple of cities that have restrictions about the kind of cars that can enter the, the city center, right? So anytime a car goes in, their license plate is scanned, and then about 20 lookups in external databases have to happen. Like, hey, how old is this car? Who is driving this? Uh, does this person have a disability? Are they a doctor? All those questions. And if the answer to one of them is yes, it's okay, the car can come in. If not, well, you're going to get a fine at the end of the month. And maybe it wasn't you driving the car, right? Um, whereas if we give the car um, a, a data pond, then if a car passes such a camera, the camera can say like, hey, car, are you allowed to enter? You can say, yes, here's my certificates. I can enter. You don't need to know the reason. Just I'm entering here because the, the 20 checks happening for every car entering a zone are, are quite an invasive. And also... It's a problem of control. Like maybe I am a doctor, maybe I'm supposed to go there for an emergency, but some piece of data didn't get updated because you know that happens all the time because I'm not in control of the data. Whereas if I'm controlling the data, I put it in my car, then I, I'm sure that I, I can enter. And so there's lots of data that doesn't belong to a person, but to other things. That kind of gets back, gets back to the early semantic web notion of an agent, um, what you just described uh, there. I suppose, again, I mean, the semantic notion of agent is an more something that has agency. So it is a piece of software acting on behalf of a human. In this case, I'm still driving the car. I'm living in a building. It's just that there's data associated with the car or building that's not associated with me. If we're building the examples, for instance, if I'm living in an apartment building uh, with, with multiple uh, flats inside, well, um, some data belongs to the entire building, like how much electricity is being used, let's say, in the hallway, for instance, and so on and so forth. Some data belongs to me, but when I leave the building, that's not my data anymore. So there's, it makes a lot of sense for different entities to have such data pods attached to them. And how do you make that determination of which data is owned uh, or controlled by, by which entity? or at least which which entities it pertains to that seems easier than i i don't um it's a very simplifying uh thing here but mm -hmm. i'm a computer scientist i think mm -hmm. my job and our job collectively is, is enablement in the sense that look there's different ways in which technology can be used i'm not prescribing i'm offering options because the answer will depend on the different legal jurisdictions uh that there are like the answer for belgium might be different from from, from the us so i don't think it, it's up to us to prescribe it will we need to enable such that it can be tested in use cases. People can see what works well. Um, the challenge, however, for us as technologists is if we claim that it works with, at a scale of, let's say, you know, millions of, of, of data vaults, um, how do we pull that off, right? So this is what we need to do. But how is it going to be used? Um, it's a very interesting discussion. Don't get me wrong. I'm just not qualified to have it. Okay. Um, well, and there are very kind of real consequences to... Uh, coming up with the right um, answer to the question, who owns, who controls this data? Uh, for example, with uh, regulations like GDPR, uh, companies are uh, required to allow their users to delete their data. Uh, so that notion of what is uh, a person's uh, personal data becomes very important. Um, how do you see you know, the notion of a personal knowledge graph or personal data vaults uh, relating to data that is uh, managed um, if not owned uh, by a company uh, that is subject to GDPR. So, need so, and, and there's GDPR in Europe and different places of the world, they start having their own uh, frameworks uh, as well. So, it's very simple. And, and let me give a concrete example, right? So, today, my local supermarket, they know what I have bought, what I am buying, what I will buy. They know it better than myself. They also know how I'm walking around in their store because I scan my groceries manually. And sometimes I think that one day they'll know how, how many times I'm breathing in and out of every aisle just to see how enthusiastic I am. This is the big data vision, like how much data can we capture? Now, interestingly, um, what they really want to know is what I'm buying with their competitors. Right? So, so if they could know that, then they would be capturing all of those things. They couldn't care less. Now, GDPR enables this. So this, what I'm going to sketch, is already a, a legal reality today. I can say supermarket ABC, give me my data. Now you delete it. And by the way, who of you want to see it? Do you see, want to see your own data again? Do you want to see what I'm buying at your competitors? So legally speaking, we can do that today. It's perfectly possible because this is data about me. I have the right to do those things. 
if people also get their personal knowledge graph, we also make the technology do that. Then we can easily get data on the knowledge graph and say, hey, supermarkets, who wants to see a part of my, my knowledge graph? And by the way, what do I get for it? Like, if you analyze my data, do I get um, better prices or better service? All of those things become possible. I'm not saying that people should necessarily trade their data. I'm just saying when you're in control, that's just one of the many options that you can have. Okay. Um, and I don't mean to, to keep harping on this one point, but it seems like a problem that's going to need to be uh, have some pretty clear solutions. So if, um, say, you know, data, uh, um, a company A captures some data about me and it goes into my personal knowledge vault. Um, that data is then shared uh, with company B. Um, how do we determine that that data that pertains to me doesn't also pertain to someone else? And is that company A is therefore exposing personal data, um, uh, someone else's personal data to a different company? This is very, seems like a big disincentive yeah. not to participate in this in this world. That, that is true, but um, this is really something that needs to be clarified. For instance, if I send a GDPR request to any supermarket out there today, how do they verify that I am who I say I am? They really don't do it that well. So it is possible to get data that that's not, not about you. So they, they, they need to get that stuff straight. But I think ultimately... It is because of the wrong way we're dealing with data today. Like today, data starts being controlled by others. Like I go go shopping, so somebody else has my data. If I want to get it back, in the future of personal data vaults, we're going to invert this. We're going to say, no, look, actually, I'm shopping here. I'm collecting the data. Who wants to see it? If you invert it, it's also easy because then you know it's your data. You're, you've been the one um, um, collecting it. So how do you, um, kind of the big picture of how do we get from where we are right now to a world where companies um, are, are participating in this world, uh, uh, contributing data, taking data out of uh, you know, data vaults, personal data vaults, yeah. um, and doing this in, in a way that um, uh, where they're not getting into trouble with respect to international regulation and so on. And uh, yeah, how do we get from here to there? So interestingly, companies are in the driving seat for this. They're asking for this, not people. I mean, people think they care about privacy, but they don't. Otherwise, we would all be on, on Facebook and so on, right? So privacy and all is not the issue. This is not how we're going to convince anyone to do it. What is the problem today is, is innovation. What you see is that, okay, there's a handful of big players on, on, on the planet who have most of the data, and everybody else is just trying to, to get a bit of the data, but because its point is to get even more data. But we know that data harvesting is a finite game. Data harvesting is limited, by the legal frameworks that we've been talking about. So yes, today, it's still the end of a viable business model where you try to collect data and the ones who have data are squeezing it to the very last drop. But no new companies are starting today with this business model, let's find as much data as possible. It's just not viable anymore. I mean, even if you could get more data than let's say Facebook, Google, and so on, well, you're still gonna hit the same legal ceiling. So there's no point, there's no growth there anymore. And interestingly, I have companies knocking my door saying, we don't want to store data, which is strange, but let me explain. For instance, um, I had a company uh, that specialized in machine learning and they had a great algorithm for um, finding jobs for people who are looking for them. Um, now, they want a price for their, their machine learning. It, it worked quite well, but in order to get the machine learning even better, they needed more data. And this is where they had a problem because the moment they start looking for more data, they are entering in direct competition with LinkedIn and that's a competition they know already beforehand they have lost. There's no point entering that. So they said, look, we don't even want the data. It's just like if somebody comes for a job, we will use their data, do our processing and give it back because we're not storing it. We don't want the competition. We don't want the legal liability. We don't want the cost. We are a machine learning company. We don't want our people uh, harvesting other people's data. We just want to do good machine learning. And this way of thinking I see is finally getting there because with a personal knowledge graph, there's going to be more data, not less. As for instance, my supermarket example ha has shown. Like suddenly one supermarket can see what I'm buying in all other places, online and offline, under my control. If I want to share with them, if I don't, well, too bad. And so you could say about, yeah, where are companies going to join in this if they might lose their data? But you know what? That's already the legal reality today. If companies are honest, they have already lost their data. GDPR takes it away from them. So the data game is, is no go anymore. 
the companies of the future will not be judged by how much data they collect, but how smart they use data that others have written in there. Because this is where the real innovation happens. Data harvesting is a boring race. We're now entering a more post big data world where doing interesting things with others' data is, is going to be more important. In order to do that effectively, you need to be able to trust the data that's provi been provided by other sources. So how do you, how do you envision approaching uh, trust and, and provenance uh, of data? Um, so um, one, one simple way to do that is um, digital signatures in a sense that if I get my data from supermarkets ABC, they can just digitally sign it and then they know it's authentic. Right? It's same thing with government data and so on. Now, there's also data that um, can, cannot be trusted. For instance, things like my personal preferences, like movies I like, food I like, my political preferences. I can say whatever I want. Um, and this is a good thing, right? And um, this is important because today a lot of data is being derived and guessed. Anyway, so it's not that data quality today is super great. It's not. Um, the future is going to be no different than that, but authenticity, you, you, you can verify that through, through signatures. I would say that today is harder to get the authenticity because companies get data, they often don't know from where, if they're allowed to use it and, and so on. So I think it's going to be much clearer, if anything. Okay, uh, so digital signatures maybe combined with a notion of, uh, again, some notion of provenance, this information came from this source and I, I trust this source, uh, therefore I trust this data. And it's mm. going to be much more explicit about that because nowadays data just ends up somewhere and, and nobody's doing a great job, I think, at, at, at tracking provenance. Um, whereas in the future, when you'll see data, you know where it comes from, you'll know for what purposes you're allowed to use it and what purposes you won't be allowed to use it for. And a user will need to be able to keep that data intact in that case in order to preserve the digital signature, right? So they wouldn't be able to go in and modify a record that was created by... That's an interesting source. Because obviously control means that I can do with my data whatever I want. I mm -hmm. can read it, I can, can change it, I can delete it, I can do anything. But if I change it, I'm going to break digital signature. So I can do it, but it's, it's not going to help me. Uh, just uh, at a kind of nuts and bolts level. So how do you um, keep track of what information is in which graph? Um, is, is it uh, name graphs that, that's used um, to keep track of a certain unit of information that is uh, provided with the signature? Um, so yeah, that would be the case. So you would need to have um, a named graph. I think the uh, named graph is the easiest way to look at it. We just say, look, mm -hmm. these, this part of the graph comes, comes from, from that place. Yeah, named graphs, I guess. So how do you get companies to um, uh, move closer to adoption of, of uh, these solutions in terms of just the technologies that are required, um, the expertise that are required of the developers uh, that will be building these applications um, obviously, people need to be able to get up to speed on RDF. They need to be able to use uh, RDF triple stores. Um, again, how do we get from here to there? Because that's been often yep. uh, a sticking point uh, when trying to exactly. introduce yeah. these things to companies. So the first thing is the value proposition. Like Without a value proposition, you're not going to get there. So in this case, it's simple. There's going to be more and more qualitative data. And, and more trustworthy data. So, so that, that's the whole premise. And you as a company, you don't have liability, you don't have responsibility. So that, that's the main thing. And from that point on, this is what our companies are interested in. And how the technology works is, is less of an issue. Like if this is what we can realize, then we need to do whatever is necessary, technologically speaking, um, to make, make it happen. Now, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has to um, start reading or using RDF. RDF is what we use for, for exchanging data. This is what, what's on the wire. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to do other processing in, in RDF quite, quite to the contrary. Um, what I think is that we'll need a very clear separation, we'll need good separation boundaries but between systems because nowadays the way we build applications is there's a very tight integration between a front end and a back end. The front end does a series of very specific API requests to, to a back end. And if the back end slightly changes, the whole application breaks. It always have to move in, in, in lockstep. Now here, of course, we're going to have to read data that we haven't written ourselves. And I think that uh, the use of queries is a very important part of the abstraction because instead of making a request themselves, the application will just to state in a query, look, this is what I'm looking for. Like, give me these details about a person. I don't care how you get them. In fact, I can't know how you get those details, but somebody just stole it from me. And to make that query 
you don't necessarily have to know RDF. It could be a GraphQL query or, or something else. It doesn't really matter. The internal engine doing all of the processing, yes, will have to be RDF everywhere. But my hope is that the, um, the whole system doesn't have to be. However, um, what I will say is that people working with this will have to understand linked data. So they have to understand data that is inherently in different places and connected together. But RDF, not necessarily. Okay, um, and in terms of sort of bridging the gap between RDF triple stores and the um, you know native uh, data backends that companies tend to use, um, uh, uh, companies tend to be very opinionated about uh, you know what what uh, database technologies they use in their you know internal uh, stack, and those are usually not RDF triple stores. Um, so. Um, how do you, yeah? How do you how do you bridge that gap? Um, obviously, companies aren't are not going to move all of the all of the data into uh, a triple store. They'll be, still be using things like Hive and key value stores and Cassandra, Who's whatever the, the case may be. It's it's all fitness for purpose. Like twenty years ago, nobody was was using the databases that they are using today, right? And even even ten years ago, like like and. Uh, every revolution has changed something. Like there was the whole, well, of course, in, in, uh, in the, uh, the old days, there was the relational database, um, but people are still using CSV today. Um, then we had all the big data tooling, so everything had to be in a big database, and now it's graph database, and who knows what it will be in, in, in 10 years. The point being that all of these exist, um, they coexist, and, and, and there's different things for different purposes. So I see RDF primarily, uh, or firstly, as the exchange format. This is what different systems talk to each other in order to preserve the semantics of the data and the distribution of the data. But how you store data, how you do the processing and so on, it's not up to me to say. So the solid, I mean, the solid ecosystem is about standards. It's about what two different agents in the system uh, speak to each other. But what you do behind the interfaces, that's all up to you. So please keep on being opinionated. Um, but when you exchange data, follow the standards. Okay. Um, well, do you have any opinions about um, or any recommendations about how to map data in and out of these these other um, you know native data um, uh, backends and, and formats, or is that kind of orthogonal to to solid? It's orthogonal to, to solid. I have a couple of ideas, and since that, for instance, um, we have um, RML, which is the RDF mapping language, which is a technology that you can use to describe any. Um, database out there or any API and, and convert data. And as I said earlier in the conversation, this is going to be the world. Like it's, we're not looking for the nirvana of data models, which would be RDF or something else. No, we are preparing for a world in which we have to continuously translate. So such tools like RML that are doing the mapping will be important. We will be running them every day instead of trying to, to move on to the next perfect data model. Everybody's still using CSV today. So we're not, if, if we're not going to get rid of, of CSV, we're going to get rid of relational databases, big data systems, and graph databases, obviously. I agree. Uh, so, you know, mappings uh, will, will be very important and standards will be important. Um, um, so who is, who is using, who, who's a good example to look at right now of companies that are kind of interacting with this ecosystem, using solid, using personal uh, data vaults and putting data in, taking data out? So it is very early days, but we have a couple of, of high profile use cases. So in the United Kingdom, the National Health Service, uh, NHS, is, is looking at how they can more efficiently manage patient data. And, and the answer is really simple. Like if patients can bring their own data to wherever they go, obviously it's going to be much uh, easier to manage that. The BBC is also looking into it and to see how media experiences can, can, can change and, and, and be personalized. And here in Belgium, um, one half of Belgium is called Flanders, and we have the Flemish government here who is looking at like, how can we give every citizen, and there are six million of us, their own data pod to make their interaction with governments and private services more efficient than it's happening today? Sure. Um, and, and coming back to the idea of, you know, how you can get uh, big companies involved, what would you say to, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazon, the, the Ubers of the world to, uh, um, to encourage us to, to, to get involved? Those are all very different companies that, that you've very made, different. obviously. So I would have different messages for each of them. But I think as people talking about those companies, as I said before, they know very well that the business models they're doing today, they're, they're fine but they, they're sitting a lot of data, so they are squeezing the lemon until the very last drop. 
but I'm sure that behind the scenes they're looking at, at other things. Um, and there's a couple of initiatives, like for instance, the data transfer projects, where um, Google, Twitter, Facebook, a couple of others, like changing data um, amongst each other. So I mean, they have to do that at some point. Like the whole silo idea um, is something of the past. They they know, but um, the good news is that I don't need to convince. Um, Facebook or Google or any other company to do this because there's plenty of use cases already. So we don't have to start from a top down. I think we can start from the bottom up. There's plenty of real cases with real problems uh, that need addressing, like, like healthcare, for instance, um, like, like people looking for jobs, like, like e-government. It's all being done so inefficiently by just having a personal data vault, we can uh, save costs. We can do it faster. We can save lives if, if the right data gets to the right points. So these are things we're doing. And we don't depend on any big company to follow. They are welcome to, but but I mean, it doesn't matter to us if, if, if they join or not. If they need to, then they will at some point. Well, I, I, I personally hope we get there. I, like I say, I, I, I find this vision of decentralized uh, personal data um, very compelling. Um, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would just say um, it's never too early to, to try it. Obviously, it's mm -hmm. uh, still a technology demo. It's very rough around the edges. And, you know, there are dozens of solutions for, for personal data faults. So which one do you pick? Well, the reason I'm picking Solid is because it's, it's standard-based. Like, like, we're not trying to be a solid.com where we say, look, hey, put your data here and everything will be fine. No, it's an ecosystem of open standards, just like the World Wide Web. And there's different browsers, there's different servers, and this is what we want. So what makes Solid different from other solutions is this focus on standards and, and, and interoperability. And um, if you want to check it out, come visit us at solidproject.org. Um, and we also have monthly Solid World meetings where we show the latest demos. And if you have interesting use cases, uh, come talk to us. That all sounds great. I realized actually there was one thing I wanted to, to, to mention um, uh, at the beginning. I said, how do you take, you know, um, X uh, a number of uh, personal knowledge vaults and put them together to form a, you know, more of a collaborative knowledge base? How do we get something like Wikidata um, out of a collection of personal knowledge vaults? Or is that something we should even attempt to do? No, this is absolutely interesting because the way we do that today is... Um, not very personalized. So if I look into any social network, I just have a collection of, of people saying things. Whereas what we really need is, I think, personalized views that depending on, on, on the context, right? So depending on what topic it is, I wanna see different kinds of knowledge and, and all these things become possible if, if we're in control. So what I imagine is a system where indeed People have their own knowledge graphs and we can see part of each other's knowledge graphs. And if I'm constructing um, a certain view, it's all about views. If I have a view about certain topics, then I'll be able to select which parts I see and which parts I don't see. And technology-wise, what's important there is, is the notion of universal semantics. Like the reason that we're looking at the linked data and not um, other graph-based systems is because the other graph-based systems, to my knowledge, uh, are always assuming that, that, that somebody controls it, like this one, entity overseeing how it's structured and hence it all works together. But this is not possible if everybody's doing their own thing. So the universal semantics will be very important in, in merging it all together. But having this personalized perspective on what stories you should trust for, for what topics, I think are also going to be a game changer. All right. Well, thanks very much for being on the Graph Show, Ruben. It's been a really interesting uh, conversation. Um, for uh, past episodes, uh, future episodes, check out uh, datageeks.tv. And that, Good. That's it. Awesome.